So we're gonna get started. So, um, uh, so for those of you who I didn't formally introduce myself, my name is Anthony Knox and I'm the Community Relations Manager for the Visiting Nurse and Hospice for Vermont and New Hampshire. And within, uh, I mean, I have a variety of different things that I do within my role, but one of my favorite parts of the job is to be able to do some training and education about the services that we provide uh, within uh, the VNH as, as we refer to ourselves. Um, one question that was asked uh, prior to, to the start of the presentation here was kind of the affiliation between Dartmouth Health and, and visiting, nurse, visiting Nurse and Hospice for Vermont, New Hampshire. And what Dartmouth Health is the, the overarching umbrella of um, uh, organizations that, you know, it's, it's kind of like a governing body to be able to get consistency across the board for all of the different uh, affiliates that are a part of, of uh, the Dartmouth Health System, which includes Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, Alice Peck Day Memorial Hospital, uh, Mount Escutney Hospital and Health Center, uh, Cheshire Medical Center, uh, New London Hospital, and the Visiting Nurse and Hospice for Vermont, New Hampshire. And just recently we have uh, started uh, the partnership with Southwestern Vermont uh, down in uh, Bennington. So, um, and then there are, you know, if you've been catching up on the news, there are some articles about uh, Valley Regional Hospital in Claremont, New Hampshire is also in the process of, of becoming part of uh, the Dartmouth Health System. So, um, but for all of the different organizations, we are all independent to, to one another. We uh, have our own CEO, we have our own board of directors, um, and you know, we all have different you know, goals and objectives that we're trying to, uh, to provide to the community members. But under the umbrella of Dartmouth Health, we're all just trying to have that same consistency and expectation of services that are being provided to, uh, to anybody who, who needs those services. So, and of course, mine is visiting nurse and hospice. So um, today's presentation is going to just be able to go through talking about all the different services that are available to you right from within the comfort of your own home. Um, you know, it's something that is different than obviously a traditional hospital setting because that we don't have, um, you know, we don't have a brick and mortar location that you're coming to. We're coming to you to be able to provide the supports to you. And so, you know, we're, we're dedicated to providing outstanding care to you within your own home. Um, you know, and, and it, could not, it could be someone you love, someone you care for, you know, in your home, outside of your home. But again, we're coming to you. And the other piece of it, too, is that people don't understand is that it, it doesn't necessarily just have to be your actual home. We work with a, a lot of individuals who are homeless that, you know, are in a shelter, in a hotel. Um, you know, if they happen to, you know, unfortunately live in a tent, you know, we'll go and provide those supports to individuals wherever they need that support. Because at the end of the day, we, we just need to take care of people and we need to try to get them into a better position. Um, we cover over 140 towns throughout Vermont and New Hampshire and, and the, the next uh, slide will show you a map of, of all those areas. Um, and again, it's, it's a variety of services, skilled nursing, rehabilitation, hospice, personal care services. Um, and that's from, from birth to, to end of life. You know, we, we don't, you know, we're not just a, an adult service agency. We also provide supports to, um, to children and, and we'll go more in depth uh, throughout the presentation. And again, we're a nonprofit. So our only goal is, is to help you and we don't, um, we don't disqualify somebody from being able to receive services based on uh, propensity to pay, having insurance, anything like that. If you need the support, we're going to go provide those supports to you. So, um, so that's just a little bit of background for us. Um, as you can see here with, with our service area map, um, you know, we are prim primarily in Vermont, uh, specifically Windsor and Wyndham counties, um, but then we, we head on over to, to Orange County as well to, to be able to provide support. And then we have a little bit of uh, New Hampshire that, that we cover uh, throughout uh, our catchment area. And you know, one of the things with um, the fact that we provide services in Vermont and New Hampshire, um, we're the only Vermont agency that, that does that. So, and, and again, it is a, it's a smaller territory within New Hampshire, but, um, but again, we try to, we try to provide a, as much care as, as humanly possible uh, in our areas. 
So we have technically five different departments of uh, visiting nurse and hospice for Vermont New Hampshire. Um, we provide home health care, which includes skilled nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Um, within that as well, uh, individuals can also get home health aids to be able to help with um, personal care needs, uh, specifically around you know, bathing and, and things like that. Um, and then we also have um, social work services available, you know, to you know, essentially you know, a little bit of case management supports to try to help direct people to uh, additional supports that they can utilize that um, you know, potentially when we're done providing that, that um, uh, support to them, that home health support, um, but they still need some additional supports. We can connect them with local um, councils on aging or just other serv social service agencies that, that can provide that support to individuals. Um, we provide hospice care, you know, which uh, can sound really scary and, and we'll go a little bit more in depth about you know, what hospice care is, but understanding that it's, it's just the support that's being provided at the end of life for somebody who um, you know, is, you know, is done with any sort of curative treatments that's just ready to, um, you know, live the life, the, the, their best life possible with whatever time that they have left. Um, we have a long-term case management uh, program, which is, you know, for, you know, from some other social service agencies, it's, it's that, that case management support to help keep somebody living in their home as long as possible. It's to be able to um, get them connected to other social service agencies on a more long-term basis. So, you know, essentially, if you, if you qualify for long-term case management, it's not going to go anywhere unless you are ready for it to, you know, stop providing that service or you reach a higher level of care that's needed where you're going to have those supports uh, around you at all times. So, um, so it's a, you know, it helps provide the ability for people to stay in their homes longer than maybe they would have been able to otherwise. Um, we also have a help at home program, which is kind of within long-term case management, but it's, it's still separate. Um, the biggest difference with that is that it's a pay for, uh, it's a fee for service. So, you know, it's not, there, there are some insurances that cover it, but if you can, if you can tell me what insurances actually cover it, that would be lovely. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's a, it's a fee for service that people can pay to have somebody come in and, and provide a variety of services that we'll go more in depth with later in the presentation. And then we have a maternal child health care program. And so literally this is a program that is when the, the child hasn't been born yet up until the age of 21. And, and again, we'll go way more in depth as far as all the different services that are provided to that individual um, and as well as their families uh, as we get later in there. So um, before I start uh, diving into anything, are there any questions that anybody has? All right, and we'll keep going. All right, so home health care skilled nursing. So um, commonly um, the supports that are being provided to somebody with the home health care skilled nursing side of things is after an injury, illness, surgery, or it could also be complications related to chronic illnesses that they have. So um, essentially for, for all of these supports, a uh, you know, primary care doctor, the surgeon, the ER doc, wherever that individual may be, would determine, hey, you could actually use some supports inside your home. We, you know, and that there are services available to you to be able to come in and, and, and help with, with those services. Um, we come in, and, and assess what's happening with the individual based on the medical history that's been provided to us. Um, you know, again, if it's a surgery, it's a little more clear cut. We know, okay, you just had your hip replaced. These are the things we need to work on so that way you can, you can walk you know, normally, you know, get back to you know, the, how you were walking prior to having surgery kind of thing. Um, you know, but again, for, for illnesses, I mean, it could have been a stroke, it could have been, um, you know, a variety of different uh, medical conditions that happen that now require some additional support within that home. And, you know, again, whether it's PT, whether it's OT, whether it's speech, speech therapy, um, wound care, uh, you know, bandage changing, whatever, you know, whatever it may be, if there's a skilled nursing need, uh, our skilled nurses would be able to come in and help you with, with that. Um, and some of the things, you know, again, that we do within that is, you know, we assess your current physical condition. 
we provide whatever the appropriate treatment is. So up, upon the assessment, we determine, oh, okay, we need, to, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, and good, bad, or indifferent, there is going to be some homework that's going to be done, expectations of doing some of these exercises or whatever the case may be in between visits. Um, and then we can also help with modifying or reorganizing your home. Because a lot of times, too, you know, we get in there, it's just like, oh, okay, you know, this, this, based on kind of how your house is set up and the flow, things like that, it could, you know, perpetuate the injury. It could, in, you know, cause the injury to get worse, not heal as quickly. So we try to assist with, um, you know, swapping some things around and kind of helping out. We can also, you know, as part of the, the social work case management supports, we can also try to help connect you with organizations that may be able to help maybe with some home modifications because, you know, maybe your, your walking isn't going to be exactly the way that it was prior to your injury and now you're going to need a ramp to get into the house or, you know, maybe you need railings attached or something like that to your house. We can also try to help facilitate getting people in to, to help with that. We ourselves are not personally going to fix, you know, things within the house, but we may be able to help adjust some things as we're going. Yep, so, so our, our nurses have the ability to, to, do, uh, to take labs where needed, you know, do different tests, things like that. Um, and then we work with, um, you know, whatever the local hospital is to be able to go and drop off that, you know, the, that lab work and things like that. So, and again, it's all based on, on uh, provider's orders. So we, um, we can't do anything unless the, a doctor has uh, essentially prescribed it for us. So, yes. Yes. So, I mean, I mean, again, you, you know, you know, you could call for, you know, for your husband and say, you know, I, I think, I think my husband could really use this and, and we're going to direct you back to your doctor or, um, you know, in some cases we may be able to reach out to your doctor and be like, Hey, this is, you know, kind of what was brought up. Um, but, uh, the easiest way to, you know, speed up the process is to reach out to your doctor directly. Or again, it, you know, if you had a medical emergency, you were in the ER, you're going to have a bunch of doctors around you. And it's just like, Hey, I need a referral to, you know, VNH or home health services to, um, you know, help me once I, you know, get home kind of thing. Um, and again, you know, within, within the home health services, we provide a bunch of different uh, therapies for individuals, um, you know, following surgery, stroke, injury, illness, you know, whatever, whatever it was that you needed this additional support with. And again, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy will all come directly to your home. And what we also find specifically with, you know, PT, OT, and speech therapy is that if you're doing these exercises in your home and you, you know, understand how to do them within your home, you're far more likely to, to get better than you go to an outpatient physical therapy office because you're learning how to do stuff in, in that setting and things like that. And sometimes it translates to home, but a lot of times it doesn't. And so like you have a, a really good understanding. You can get in that, that routine right at your home, understanding it. And, you know, and eventually what, what our goal is, is, is to get you back to baseline, you know, to get you back to a point where you could then start going to outpatient, you know, outpatient, you know, nursing visits or PT, OT, you know, things like that. Um, but we help, we help get you back to baseline of where you were um, or back to a point where it's going to be easy for you to actually get to these appointments. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit too about how to qualify for, for these home health services, which is, we're going to talk about it right now. Um, so the, the primary thing around um, home health uh, services in particular is that you're, tech, you're quote unquote homebound. Now, Homebound just means that it's a taxing effort for you to get out of your home. You know, it doesn't mean that you're, you're actually stuck in your home. You, it's not like you have to stay home, you know, during the, you know, whatever, however long of a process we're going to be in your home. Um, but you have, you, it has to be very difficult for you to get out. And, and again, most pre-op patients would, are also considered homebound because you're going to be on pain medications, especially at the beginning. Um, you know, a lot of the pain medications, they say don't drive, don't operate heavy machinery, you know, all these different things. Um, so you're probably going to, you're probably going to qualify for uh, home health services based on that as well. Um, 
but absences from your home are, are infrequent. So, you know, you know, you're not, you know, maybe prior to this injury, you're, you know, you're living your best life. You're always on the road. You're doing all these fun things. You're going to concerts and baseball games, whatever the case may be. Right now, you're probably not going to, but there are still reasons why you're going to leave your home. And, and again, it, you, you're probably still going to have some medical appointments, even though we are providing some care to you within your home. Um, you know, special occasions. You're going to go to, you're going to go to your kid's birthday party. You're going to go, you know, you're going to go watch your grandson play baseball, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, you go to church every Sunday, you know, you have, you know, you have a hair appointment, you know, uh, th there's a bunch of different reasons why you, you would still leave your house. And all of these reasons are beneficial specifically probably for your mental health beyond anything else. So, um, but again, it's not, it's not like from sunup to sundown, you're going to be gone all day because then, well, then you're probably moving around. Okay. You're, you probably don't actually need some in-home services at that point, but, um, you know, uh, and then individuals who, you know, maybe have some vision impairment in particular, um, you know, uh, would be considered homebound because, you know, you need that, that support potentially to, to get out of the house. Um, you know, individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia, you know, the, those cognitive uh, disabilities where, you know, you're going to need somebody to provide support to you in home. Um, and you, you know, you probably don't get out of the house as, as much as, as you would like. Um, cardiac disease is another big thing. So, you know, we know a lot of people with, with cardiac disease and, and heart troubles and things like that, you know, have a lot of fatigue and even getting out of the house is, is very difficult for them. Those would be people that for sure qualify for our services um, to be able to come in and provide that, that support within the home. Um, and then, you know, again, you have the ability to drive around, but you, you know, it's still very difficult for you to drive around based on what your current medical condition is. Those, these are, you know, these are just some of the reasons as to why you would qualify for in-home supports um, uh, to, to get better. Hospice care. So, you know, one of the things that, that I will say right off the bat is I know that in a lot of people's minds, hospice care means that that person is, is going to die very soon. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's a very scary thing. It's a lot of people think that it's just that, that little bit of support right at the very end of life. But one of the things that, that I want people to really understand about hospice care is that it's a service that is available long before the end quote unquote. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more um, about that in a moment, but um, in, order, in order to qualify for hospice care, two providers would have to agree that there is a life ex ex expectancy of less than six months. So um, our medical director, uh, Dr. Christy Maloney, and the primary care provider, the ER doc, whomever is, is essentially assessing this patient would make the determination that this individual has less than six months to live based on their current uh, medical prognosis, as well as um, just understanding that if there was no treatment being provided um, and we just let the disease run its natural course, that, that this individual would pass away within six months. Um, the care that's provided is is palliative, which just means managing the symptoms of that individual. It's not curative. So for example, somebody who's been on chemo for cancer wouldn't be able to be on, on chemo for, for cancer because that's curative versus you know, managing the symptoms that it, that individual has. Um, and uh, the, the full team that provides support to the individual, uh, you know, nurses, doctors, chaplains, and our social workers all have a part in providing supports to individuals um, you know, and not only just the individual who is the patient, but also the care team around that individual. So, you know, specifically in, in the hospice situation, um, not only taking care of the patient, but also taking care of that patient's care team is, is as important um, during hospice. Um, so some of the qualifications for hospice is just kind of a, you know, the general guidelines. So again, a life limiting condition. So, uh, six months or less that that individual, um, has, uh, remaining, um, the pro a progression of the disease. So again, you know, going back to cancer, you know, uh, stage, stage one cancer, maybe not qualifying for hospice based on, you know, that stage four cancer. We're, we're probably talking, you know, hospice supports would be a, a valuable resource for individuals. 
um, frequent hospitalizations, office or ER visits. You know, as as this individual, um, you know, is you know going to the hospital more and more often for a variety of different reasons, there may be there may be some underlying causes that you know some additional lab work or testing needs to be done to kind of determine that you know perhaps this individual is. Um, is actively dying and, and you know, may need that, the, the hospice supports that are available. Um, weight loss is greater than 10% over the past six months. Um, and then the patient or family uh, wants to focus on symptom relief and management and they're, they're not looking to cure. I mean, uh, I personally have experienced, you know, some of my family members who, you know, fought cancer for years and years and years and finally just said, I'm done. Like, I don't, I don't wanna do this anymore. Um, and so, you know, they made the decision, family supported it, and, you know, they, they had gone on hospice at that point. Um, and then some of the, you know, some of the common uh, diseases to qualify for, for hospice, and again, um, I didn't include cancer on here. I kind of, you know, feel that that's, that's a very, very common reason for somebody to go on hospice, but, you know, again, it's essentially end stage diseases. You know, once a once a doctor or provider has determined that they're, you know, at the at the end stage, then you know they're they're likely going to qualify for hospice. Um, but we also provide uh, hospice care to individuals, you know, after having a stroke or coma. Again, depending on you know what the prognosis is based on that. Um, and then um, you know ALS is is another thing. And and some of the the dementia, ALS, you know, de uh, Alzheimer's, things like that can be very challenging to kind of diagnose. Um, but the other thing to understand is that, you know, an individual who has a prognosis of six months or less, that doesn't mean necessarily that they will pass away in that next six months. We have had people on hospice that have, you know, remained alive for two years. You know, they, they still, you know, they're, it's a very slow progression, but, um, but they, you know, with, you know, with the supports that they were receiving, they were able to live their life for you know the next two years and not and not just being stuck at home sick like being able to go out and live their life you know travel do all these different things and one of the things and i don't remember if i put it on in the presentation um but just because you're receiving home health or you're receiving hospice supports here in rochester in vermont you can go to rochester new hampshire rochester new york those are the only three Rochester's I know off the top of my head. But you could go to California, you can go uh, overseas, things like that. And what the home health agency, you know, VNH is able to do is we would contact the local home health and hospice agency in that area that you're going to be and be able to continue those services right there, you know, with you. So say you've got family in California, you know, out in Los Angeles. We're going to connect with an agency in Los Angeles, transfer your care to them while you're there for however long. And then when you leave, they're gonna transfer it right back to us. So there's no lapse in, in services, no lapse in um, you know, getting whatever treatment that you need. It's just, you know, potentially it's gonna be a little bit sunnier where you're going. That's, that's you know, really the only difference, so. And what does the hospice benefit cover? So you know, one of the things too that I really want to stress related to hospice is that it's an entitled benefit, especially uh, for anybody who's on Medicare. You're a, this, this is for you. Like you, you paid your dues, you paid into the system, you did all these different things, and Medicare is gonna take care of you at the, at the very end. And other insurances will, will as well. Um, I, I will say, you know, thankfully, um, you know, most individuals who are on our hospice service have Medicare. There's, there's you know, not a lot that are on private insurance or, or Medicaid or, you know, all these different things. So, um, but, you know, again, we provide a variety of, of services that uh, the individual can receive during uh, this time. And not only the individual, but the family providing services. And I want to, in particular, talk about, you know, the social worker and, and chaplaincy services, which is kind of in the middle of this slide. Um, 
our social worker social work team in particular really helps with advanced care paper uh, advanced care directives advanced care paperwork um, to just have everything in line you know for that individual and maybe maybe there was it was very sudden that the, you know this individual is now you know has a prognosis of six months or less and there's no funeral arrangements set up there's no you know anything set up our social work team can provide those supports to help coordinate and and get that stuff together because we know that especially at the end of life all of that stuff really falls by the wayside and you really want to just spend time with that individual um, and we're here to help with kind of the the paperwork aspects of things to just really be able to help the the loved ones of that individual um, in addition to while the individual is still with us after they've passed away we our chaplaincy program still provides support up to 12 months after the individual has passed away, whether it's you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions, phone calls, emails, text messages, whatever, whatever it is that, that you're looking for, we're able to just continue to provide that support. And I say 12 months, we have individuals who on the anniversary of their loved one passing away still reaches out to our chaplains 10 years after the fact. So our chaplains are never going to say, sorry, it's only 12 months you know, it'll go on for as long as they, they need that support and, and they're more than happy to, to do that. Um, in addition, our social work team also helps with any, you know, end of life, you know, after the individual has passed away, um, you know, paperwork and, you know, maybe, maybe they have a question about like, you know, probate court or, you know, all these different things. Like our, t our team is still there to be able to assist uh, after the individual has passed away. Um, and then in addition to, um, you know, we also help coordinate um, respite care for, for individuals, whether it's, you know, potentially somebody coming to the house, more likely than not, it's um, they have the ability to go to a local facility, a hospital, a, a nursing home, whatever the case may be. Um, we have contracts throughout the state of Vermont to um, have people be able to stay in a, uh, in a facility, maybe for a weekend, you know, I think it's up to a week, something like that, um, where the individual, you know, can go there, get the care that they need, and their caregivers, you know, can have a break. And, and we all know that that's also so important to be able to, to have those breaks and, and um, you know, just get that little bit of extra support. So, you know, we help coordinate that as well. So, um, any, any questions about the hospice benefit or, or anything like that? So, so Jack Burn Center is one of the places that we work with, um, but I mean, we would also, you know, potentially, I think at, at one point, and, and I'm not, I don't quote me on this, but like Gifford Medical, I think has some respite beds, things like that, you know, to, to be able to just keep, try, we try to keep them as local as possible, um, while at the same time understanding that it may be a little bit of a drive, you know, and, and, and again, even if it's a respite situation where you, you know, the, the individual goes there to be able to, you know, stay overnight for a few nights so that, you know, you as the caregiver have the ability to sleep for, you know, a few nights. That's not to say that you're not going to still go see them during the day and, and spend time and do those different things like that. But, you know, maybe it's just you need to be able to get a few nights of sleep, you know, kind of thing. So, um, you know, so we try to we try to get the individual as close as possible to where their home is. Um, you know, it's all it's all just a matter of availability. And so one of the other big parts is volunteering for hospice. So um, uh, my, my friend Nils here in the back is our uh, bereavement and, and volunteer coordinator for our hospice program. And, you know, one of the things that we find is, is as important as anything the VNH is doing around nursing and chaplaincy and social work and things like that are volunteers to be able to you know, go spend time with the individual. And, and a big part of this too is, is to provide a little bit of respite for the, the caregivers. So that way, you know, maybe, maybe they need to go, well, you know, have, they have a hair appointment. They need to go run, grab groceries, whatever the case may be. You know, we can have somebody come in and, and you know, hang out with them for a little bit. And, and even some, you know, for some individuals who maybe don't have a lot of, um, you know, family in the area, you know, supports in the area, things like that. You know, it's somebody who can come in and, and you know, spend some time with that individual. Um, you know, and so, I mean, again, this is, this is the smallest list humanly possible of what you could do for, you know, being a hospice volunteer, but 
Um, but es essentially, it's just being there for the individual and, and providing some support. So, um, you know, so we're, again, we're always looking for people who, who want to volunteer. Um, you can go to our website, vnhcare.org, to, to learn a lot more about it. Um, or after the presentation, just ask Nils. So, so um, our long-term case management services. So, um, so this is a service that um, primarily, uh, you know, Medicaid uh, patients in particular are the ones that, that receive the service, but all insurances are, are accepted related to it. Um, but so one of the things to understand with this is that, so you would have a case manager who's essentially coordinating all the supports that, that you have and, and they're traditionally our, one of our staff, but there are some situations where you may be able to hire your own case manager to kind of manage all of your supports. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, you know, we help coordinate a variety of different services for you or a, a loved one to be able to stay in, in home longer than potentially you would have been able to otherwise. Um, you know, so we, we provide, you know, several things within the home. Um, you know, again, we help with coordinating, you know, with emergency response systems, you know, uh, lifelines and, you know, all, you know, all those, you know, kind of things where you can press a button and, you know, have somebody come to your home, um, as well as, you know, assistive devices, home modifications. I mean, we can help coordinate with, you know, potentially getting, you know, one of those seats that bring you up the stairs or, you know, help with building a ramp outside your house or, you know, different things like that that may be needed for you to be able to stay in your home. Otherwise, you might have to go live, go live with a family member or, you know, go live in a nursing home or whatever the case may be. So, you know, so we do a, a bunch of different stuff. Um, outside of the home, you know, we can also help with coordinating, um, you know, supports within, um, you know, different, t different types of living situations. So, I mean, again, it may not be your home, but maybe you're living in a, like a next level down from a nursing home kind of thing. Like it's, it's, you know, uh, I'm thinking of the, um, uh, the woodlands in, in Lebanon, New Hampshire. It's a, uh, it's a, a assisted living facility. Everybody's independent, you know, is able to do different things, but there's somebody there at all times to be able to assist with a variety of different things. Like you still don't meet the nursing home level that you may need, um, and you can still live a, a, at home, but maybe you need somebody to, you know, come check on you twice a day kind of thing. You know, we can help coordinate stuff like that and still provide supports for that individual there. Um, you know, and then up to, um, you know, everything, you know, and eventually getting to a nursing home and, and where you would have those fully well-rounded supports, we can help coordinate and, you know, help with long-term Medicaid to, you know, help pay for those kind of things and, and things like that. So, um, you know, so we provide, we provide a lot of different things within the, the long-term case management um, service. Um, you know, and again, within, within our long-term case management, I mean, we, you know, we're there. We're there to help with, you know, whatever it is that you may need. Um, again, we may not be, as the VNH, we may not be the specific agency to help with everything, but we're going to help, we're going to help get that well-rounded supports around you. You know, you know, whether it's, you know, we help you get, you know, food stamps set up, or we help you with rent assistance or fuel assistance or, you know, all these different things. Um, you know, we, you know, we connect with Sevka to be able to help, um, you know, winterize your home and, and do different things. You know, we're, we're providing that case management supports and it can be, you know, it can be a situation where, you know, we're there once a month. There's a, there's situations where we may need to be there every day, you know, it's, and it's all going to be determined upon what that individual needs. So, um, you know, so we provide, you know, we, again, it's just to be able to help you stay in your home as long as possible. And within the long-term case management program, we have the ability of doing something that's called flexible choices. And basically what that means is, is that, you know, you would come to us, we'd, we'd get you all approved to be able to have this long-term case management, but maybe, you know, you know somebody who can um, be the quote-unquote case manager for you. You know, you know maybe it's a, a brother or a friend or whatever the case may be. And, you know, they may be then responsible for, you know, ensuring that a plan is developed for how the funding that you're receiving through this program is being used. Within that, that funding, you know, you would also be able to hire um, what's called a personal care attendant to uh, potentially take you to doctor's appointments or grocery shopping or running all of these different errands and things like that. Um, but also just, you know, some companionship uh, services for, 
um, for you. So essentially it, it's the same services, but you have more flexibility um, with who would actually be providing that service to you versus you know, with, with us with the VNH, you know, it would be one of our case managers, one of our personal care attendants, and you know, maybe, maybe you don't gel as well with them and, and you know somebody that you would gel with better. They're still, th those individuals would still be working with the VNH just like you are to ensure that you know, money is being appropriately used to, to provide these services and, and whatnot. But, um, but again, you have more flexibility. And again, our PCA staffs, maybe they're not keen on you know, taking you out at seven o'clock at night to go do something, but maybe your person that you know is, is very willing to take you out at seven o'clock at night to, to do some sort of activity. So, um, so you know, and that's something that, that can be discussed with our um, long-term case management team and, and you know, uh, get that all set up. And I've already explained to you what makes flexible choices different than traditional services. So I'm just going to skip this slide. Um, and then our help at home, pro help at home program, again, I, I had mentioned that at the beginning. Um, again, it's a, it's a fee for service um, uh, program. Um, as you can see, it's about right now, it's $35 an hour for the first 40 hours and then $45 thereafter. Um, and then there's also mileage involved if um, you're asking the one of the individual to transport you to appointments and, and things like that. Um, but, and it's non, it's non-medical. Like that's the most important thing to remember as well is that, you know, they're not going to be able to specifically help you with any of the maybe medical things that you need outside of, they can help with setting up like pill planners and, and things like that, helping with the medications, but like they can't check your blood pressure. They can't check your blood sugar, you know, they, you know, different things like that, like that, that's not what they're trained to be able to do, but they can help with personal care stuff like showering or toileting and, and things like that, dependent upon if, if those are things that, that are needed. So, um, and, uh, and again, it, it, this kind of falls under the long-term case management program, but it is a separate entity altogether. Yes. Um, we have long-term care insurance, and credential insurance. I'm wondering if they you know, cover things like that. So, so from what I understand with some insurances is that it, um, there are some insurances that have those supports in it, but it's for a short period of time, like maybe a year or two max. And so, so it's a matter of just kind of like talking with that insurance company and, and understanding that. Um, some, so for like, for example, like maybe, maybe you're on the tail end of being able to live independently, but you have this, this, you know, this insurance that could potentially have somebody come in and help like with homemaking and things like that. Um, you know, we would be able to, you know, and then, you know, provide that over the next two years. And then maybe in that two year time frame, it's kind of transitioning into the next phase of your life of, as far as where you're going to live and things like that. Um, but ultimately uh, what I would just say is, is talk to your, talk to your in, insurance agent or, or that company or whatever, and just make sure you have an understanding. I am to have, you know, understand that there are some insurances that it's a lifetime benefit to be able to do stuff like this on top of then, um, you know, if you need to go into a nursing home, it's all set and ready to go. Um, but that is few and far between it. There's usually a, a time frame in which you can utilize it. And, and what I understand is like, maybe you use it for a year, you don't need to use it again for another five, and then you use the rest of it, like within a year or something like that. So. Does this require a referral? No, no. So this is, uh, this and, and long-term case management don't actually require referrals. Um, it's just a matter of calling the VNH and asking us about these services and, and getting you set up. And, and, and in both the, the help at home's not so much a like assessment and determination kind of thing. Cause again, it's, it's a fee for service. Um, but the long-term case management, they would do an assessment to determine whether or not you meet the qualifications for it. And there's, you know, within the long-term case management, there's, you know, there's income requirements and, and, you know, a variety of different things that, that you, you would go through with, um, with our, our intake person related to that. All right. And then, um, because a lot of people really don't understand that we have, we also have a maternal child health program. Um, so again, we provide care from, from, you know, birth until the end, you know, so, um, you know, and we provide uh, services, including skilled nursing, um, strong families, which is a, a very specific education program that we'll talk about and a pediatric palliative care program. So 
different than our hospice program if there is unfortunately a child who needs to go through hospice care um, our our pediatric palliative care program actually cares for that so and it's obviously it's a a different skill set to be able to provide that that end of life care for someone um, under the age of 21 versus someone who is in their 90s you know so um, so skilled nursing so um, skilled nursing with, within the program this has to have a referral from a doctor to um, to receive those services um, you know and it can be prenatal visits postpartum um, uh, visits for a uh, mother with history of blood clots, diabetes, hemorrhage, and you know maybe some breastfeeding challenges. Um, inf infant has difficulty feeding or failure to thrive, and the children has a new diagnosis requiring in-home education following hospitalization. So, um, one of the things you know, especially within our skilled nursing program for children, is um, moms and dads who maybe don't understand how to use some of the equipment that that child is going to need to use temporarily for the rest of their life whatever the case may be so we're able to provide that care in home um, so that they understand better how to um, how to take care of their child um, you know again it's the the primary goals and objectives are to provide that support to the child and and the mom in particular um, you know, obviously dad, dad is going to get the same education as mom is in, in, in a lot of these situations. Um, but there, there's a lot of situations where um, the, the mom needs to be the primary focus. And in particular, with the Strong Families program that is available to, um, to new moms um, from, the, from the time that the, the child is, hasn't been born yet up until about two years. Um, there, this is a very specific educational program that has been developed. It was actually developed in Australia, and Vermont is one of two states currently that um, utilize uh, the, this program. Um, we have been trying for it to also be in New Hampshire because we know it's such a valuable resource, um, and New Hampshire has not wanted to do it yet. So, um, but essentially, it, the, the Strong Families program helps provide an educational foundation for, for new moms in particular to be able to care for, for their child. Um, within the, the program, um, the, there are 25 specific lesson plans that uh, a mom goes through to um, you know, just better understand uh, providing these supports. And we have had moms who you know, are on their second or third child who are doing this program as opposed to right after their first one. And it's also something that can be done with every child because, you know, we all know every kid is different in that, especially in that first couple of years. So, um, you know, and, and it's something that, you know, it goes up to two years of age for the, that child. Or, you know, if you, you know, you get through all the educational stuff sooner, you know, sooner than that, then you're able to quote unquote graduate and, you know, you're, you're ready to go. That doesn't mean that we're done, you know, we're all, we're all set, you know, kind of thing. Um, you know, we're still available to be able to provide education and support to, uh, to new moms, you know, if they have any additional questions and, and things like that. So, you know, similarly to, you know, chaplaincy services after somebody has passed away, you know, we're, we're gonna be in your life if, if you need us to still be there and, and provide that additional support, so. And then, um, again, uh, with the pediatric palliative care program for uh, children. Um, it's offered to anybody 21 years or younger um, with a medical condition with a prognosis of death that is highly probable to be before the child reaches 21. So unlike hospice, this support being provided can last 21 years, essentially. You know, it, it, you know an individual, um, can also still receive curative treatment during this. So, you know, it, it's, it's possible that a child is not going to see their 21st birthday, but they can still receive all the treatments that they need to hopefully, you know, beat whatever disease is, is happening in this situation. Um, and, and again, it's very similar to our hospice services, you know, providing that, that support to, to the individual in, in whatever capacity it may be, you know, up to and including, understanding that they're probably not going to be cured and you know we have to come to that realization that unfortunately this individual is going to pass away 
and you know so maybe there's you know some you know they they just want to do art they just want to do music you know for the end of you know the end of their uh their life, um, you know, we're able to provide the, those supports to to that individual, help coordinate, and then of course, you know, providing any family grief counseling um, and, and bereavement supports uh, to that individual's uh, family. So, are there any questions that anybody has with anything that, that I've talked about over the last 45 minutes or so? All right. Well, um, again, like I said, my name is Anthony Knox. I'm the Community Relations Manager. Um, in the, the packets that you all have, you have all of my contact information, um, but there's also uh, some business cards on the back table if there are any questions. Um, please don't hesitate to call me, email me um, to be able to answer. Um, and uh, I want to thank you all for, uh, for coming and hanging out with me this, uh, this morning. So it was, uh, it was great, and I hope you, you all got uh, something out of it. So have a great day.